have you ever read something in the Bible and uh, you don't like what it says? Anybody ever had something like that? You read it and you're like, yeah, I don't really like that part of it. Um, Jesus had a lot of um, things that he said to his disciples, to the, the teachers of the law when he was here on this earth that basically cut to the heart immediately. Jesus didn't come necessarily just to be friends with everybody, but he spoke truth, and he spoke truth in love, right? But what he said, it confronted people. It confronted people with their sin. He exposed what's going on in their hearts and in their lives. And so uh, last week, Pastor Austin kicked off a a short little mini-series that we're doing uh, last week and tonight called Things That We Wish Jesus never said. Things we wish Jesus never said. So I was reading through um, a couple of the Gospels and I pulled out just a few things here that maybe would be difficult truth for us to deal with. So uh, Jesus said, blessed are you if you're persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, if you're angry with your brother, you're going to be subject to judgment. He said, if you look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. Jesus said, if you strike, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, what do you do? You turn to him, the other one also. He said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. That is not something that is easy to deal with, is it? Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. That is a tough one to hear sometimes, isn't it? Because we like our things. We like our stuff. Um, Jesus says, if you don't forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Ouch. Jesus says, don't take revenge. But it's so fun sometimes, right? Uh, Jesus says, if you're offering your gift up the altar and there, remember that your brother has someone, something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gifts. And one thing that, that was always painful to me to read says, but I tell you, Jesus said this, I tell you that men will have to give accounts on the day of judgment for every careless word that they have spoken. These are some things that maybe we could say, I wish Jesus never said that. And you probably have one or two things also. My list is probably longer because I'm not as holy as you, all right? But uh, there's, there's a lot in there. And, and it's not that we disagree with what Jesus said, but it cuts to the heart, doesn't it? That's what is happening. Um, that's why Jesus spoke these words, because he cares for people and he gets straight to the heart. So it's not in disagreement, but it's difficult truth. It's dealing with my sinful nature. And I don't like that sometimes, right? It's dealing with my selfishness. And sometimes I just want to be selfish. Anybody else like that too? Sometimes that's what we just want. And uh, these are some things that we wish Jesus never said, but we're thankful that Jesus did say it. So last week, like I said, Pastor Austin uh, kicked things off with um, go and make disciples. You can go back and watch it. But tonight we're going to talk about um, a short little uh, passage that Jesus said in Luke chapter 9. But let me give you context real quick before we read this of what Jesus is about to say. So Jesus, he's talking to his disciples. He says, who do people say that I am? Uh, John the Baptist, Elijah, uh, other prophets. That's what people are saying. And then Jesus says to his disciples, but who do you say that I am? And um, Peter stands up and he says in uh, verse Uh, 20, he says, the Christ of God. And so Jesus basically confirms, yes, you're correct. This is what it is. I'm the son of man. I'm the son of God. And here's what's about to happen. Jesus goes on to say, I'm going to have to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. I'm going to raise, be raised back to life. And so he's laying this all out to his disciples. And then we get to verse 23 of what Jesus says. And in in fact, before we get to that point, I want to point out one thing that uh, the books of Matthew and Mark, they record Peter doing what we hope someone someone would have done when Jesus says this. Like, I'm about to go and suffer and die, and people are going to beat me up and kill me. And we hope that someone would have stood up, and Peter did, and said, not on my watch, basically. That's what Peter's saying. Like, we're not going to allow this to happen. And so Peter goes from being bold and courageous to Jesus saying, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block. Like, the, the pillar of the church to all of a sudden, like, you're a stumbling block to Jesus. And so Jesus was not there to mince words. But he then goes in verse 23, very short but, but important, and he says this, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself 
and take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus, we thank you for your word, and I pray that um, you would speak and minister to every person that's here tonight. We thank you that they're here. It is not by accident. And so do what only you can do, Jesus. In your powerful name we pray, and everybody said amen. Real quick, so Jesus is saying, come after me. The other gospels say this too. If you want to come after me, it's not like if you want to chase after me type of thing, but basically he's saying, if you want to be my disciple, all right? And Warren Wearsby kind of explains a disciple like this, an apprentice. If you've ever gone to an apprenticeship or you know someone who's done that, basically they're learning hands-on. They, they're not sitting in um, a lecture hall and someone just lecturing them on what to do and how to live a disciple life. Uh, Jesus is saying, if you want to be my disciple, you're going to have to come along with me. You're going to be my apprentice, which I learn better that way than by someone lecturing me. Anybody else like that? Like, uh, show me, please. Just take me along. Show me a few times. I'll figure it out after that point. And that's how I tend to learn. And so that's basically what, if you want to say, the disciple means and coming after Jesus, that's what it is. And Warren Wearsby says too many Christians, they're content with being listeners, just gaining a bunch of knowledge, but they never put that knowledge into practice. So I want you to notice something, that Jesus starts this entire statement out, statement out with a two-letter word, if. All right, Jesus says, if anybody would come after me, if. So Jesus is not assuming that it's just going to be automatic, that everybody's just going to want to jump on this boat and just ride along with them. Jesus says, if you will come after me. He, Jesus doesn't guilt us into doing this. Um, this is a choice that each of us make. Jesus lays out like the steps. Jesus is laying this out that it's not going to be difficult. This is the path. There's going to be joys. There's going to be hardships. But if you choose to do this, this is what it's going to be. It's almost as if Jesus says, if you want the greatest adventure life has to offer, here's the ticket price, right? If you want the greatest adventure that life has to offer, here's the ticket price. Last summer, my family and I got away and we went to Denver and we spent some time in Colorado Springs. And here's a picture of us on a, a fun day that we had. We stayed in the Colorado Springs area. And if you've ever been there before, uh, we stayed close to the Air Force Academy and we were there during jump school. So every morning you'd wake up and you look outside and, and the, the students were jumping out of the airplanes. So we got to see that. We we're close to Garden of the Gods, which is a really cool place to go to and explore and climb and hike and all this kind of stuff. But one of the days was probably my favorite day. We got up early in the morning. We went and we found some local trails that wasn't the popular trails that all the tourists go on. And uh, we hiked and we found this cool overlook. Um, it was a, a little bit dangerous at times, but we survived. And that was a fun time. And then we drove down to Canyon City. Anybody ever been to Canyon City? This is where the Royal Gorge is, that area. Um, a really cool drive. And um, we ended up going whitewater rafting. Who here, I'm curious, who here has been whitewater rafting? Oh, wow. All right. And you've survived, right? You've, you've lived to tell and see another day. So uh, we had to purchase our tickets in advance um, just because that's, they, the rafts fill up quickly. And because of COVID, they couldn't have a lot of numbers in a boat. So it's just my family and I. Uh, we had never done it before. I think my wife, Jamie, had done it once or twice beforehand. So we sign up. We get to this place. This is us before we go. We get onto the bus to go down to the river. And this was the only picture that we took because when you go, those of you who have gone before, you don't take your phone, right? You don't take anything that is valuable. You leave it with there. You leave it in the car with them in a the locker. And uh, then you can get pictures, but they're like, $80 a picture. And it's like, ah, this is the one that we settled for, all right? So we're dry, we're happy then. So uh, we take the bus ride down to where the, the drop-off point was, and we had a really cool um, guide. And the, the rapids, let me explain real quick, the class of rapids go from, from what I believe, one to six. One is like 
moving water, simple, easy. Six is unsurvivable, all right? This is, six is like, if you survive it, it's now a five because six is too big, all right? That's what our guide said. And so we signed up to do the one through three. Has anybody done the fours and fives before? Okay, wow, good job. Um, so someday I, I want to do that. So we signed up for the one through three. We're getting there. And the three, like the, the max that we were there, the, the height of the waves was four to five feet, you know, over the bow of the front. And, and it was fun. We got wet. Our guide let us, after it was all said and done, just like float down the river and uh, go down there. When we got to the stopping point and the bus is waiting and we're, we're out trying to dry off and just enjoy the, the views and everything. I very quickly was thinking, I want to do that again. But next time I want the bigger one. You like, I want, I want to go big. Let's, let's, let's explore and have some fun and go on the biggest stuff and see if I can survive a six. No, I'm just, I didn't think that. But, um, but in order to do that, what happens? You got to pay more money right? Like we paid a certain price and this is what we expected, but to, to have a bigger adventure, you got to pay more money. And unfortunately, I feel like sometimes we as Christians, we can look at the, the brochure that is offered to us as uh, a, a, the life of following Jesus, and we look at it and say, nah, that's too much. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to go that far. That's too high of a price to pay. And so we settle, we settle for what's comfortable like that little boy did and, and we just stay by the bleachers all the time. And all the time God is saying, listen, I have so much for you. I have this full life, an adventurous life here laid out for you. Trust me, it's going to be a high price to pay, but I promise you it's going to be worth it. And so I want you guys to understand something that there's only a few that are willing to say yes to Jesus. Count the cost, obey him, and come after him. And so what we're going to, what we just read, Jesus makes the price very clear, doesn't he? He makes it very clear. And, and he gives us three things that if we're going to come after him and be his disciples, here's what it's going to look like. And you're already ahead of me. You've already heard this scripture preached probably a million times, but I want us to go over it again. And I'm praying that there would be just kind of a, a fresh, renewing spirit that Jesus would speak to you um, through his word tonight, that this wasn't just something that would gloss over, think, I've heard this before, I know where you're going, what you do, um, but allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. So Jesus makes this price very clear, and point number one is this, deny yourself. Deny yourself. So this is more than just self-denial, right? For this past week, we've been encouraged to fast something, and I fasted something, and I know many of you did too, um, and that's a portion, I, I believe, of, of what denying yourself looks like, but I don't think that's truly what Jesus means. Denying yourself, to me, means saying no to yourself and yes to God. Have you ever played the game King of the Mountain? I'm curious. Raise your hand. You've played King of the Mountain, okay? So imagine having this massive snow pile. As you leave church, you'll see a massive snow pile. And uh, the goal is to be on the top of the mountain, the snow mounds, and stay there. And if you're not there, your goal is to take out whoever is on top, okay? And you'll do whatever you have to do. Push them. It's not a safe game, to be honest, all right? So I don't recommend it necessarily, but if you're up for an adventure, go for it. But your goal is to take out whoever's on top and remain on the top. And so it can be a very physical game. So imagine, if you will, for a moment, um, Brian Urlacher. Remember the linebacker for the Bears? Or do you remember Derek Thomas for the Chiefs? Um, what about Ray Lewis, you know, for the Baltimore Ravens? Imagine somebody like that, that they're not the king, but they're about to be the king, you know, and you're at the top and you see one of those linebackers coming after you, uh, you're not going to survive. For sure, I'm not surviving. I'm too little, all right? So one of those guys, they're coming to hit you, hit you hard, take your head off, and do whatever they have to do to be king on the top. And, and we have to look at denying ourselves as that, is that when, when our selfishness is rising up, imagine like one of those linebackers coming and taking out our selfishness and, and destroying that. To deny yourself means to dethrone yourself and make way for the true king. No longer are you calling the shots. You're denying yourself. How many of you would agree we have this innate selfishness? 
Like, our selfishness rises up all the time, and that's what Jesus is addressing here. He's saying, to deny yourself means deny your selfishness. We're selfish by nature. We want to rise above other people. We get what we want, and we get it when we want it. We put our needs in front of other people other people's needs. Listen, when I deny myself, my selfishness is the, what takes the biggest hits, and it hurts. Right? How many of you would say, when I've denied myself, my selfishness hurts. It takes the biggest hit, but I promise you, it's for the good. When you deny yourself, you're starving your selfishness. So I want to encourage you right now, um, if you're taking notes, you can jot down a few thoughts, but I want you to, to identify the things that could be a source of your selfishness. What could be a source of your selfishness? Maybe it's certain movies or TV shows, books, people that you're around, the gossip that people use around you, critical talk, coarse joking, lying, whatever, you fill in the blank, but what could be a, a, a source of your selfishness? And then I challenge you to, to work on that, to deny it. Listen, if you want to deny yourself, you've got to stop feeding your selfishness. You need to starve it. Think of Peter. Peter, he denied Jesus three times, didn't he? And do you remember one of the times someone says, hey, I recognize you. You were with Jesus. You were with that guy. And what did Peter say to that person? I don't know that person, right? He's like, I don't know who you're talking about. When our selfishness rises up, we have to look at, our, at that and say, I don't know that part of me any longer. I don't know who that is. That's not me. I have nothing to do with that. That's kind of what we have to do. John the Baptist, uh, when he was preparing the way for Jesus and he was preaching just before Jesus took over, John the Baptist says that he, meaning Jesus, he must become great. Greater and, and what? I must become less. That's what we have to do. When our selfishness is rising up, we have to pray and ask God to help us and say, you, you need to be greater in this situation. You need to help me. I need to become less. All right? So what part of denying yourself do you need to do? The second one is this. Take up your cross. Everybody knew what the cross represented back then. We know what it represents now. But imagine being one of the disciples and hearing Jesus say this. All right, he says, you need to take up your cross daily and follow me. Um, it's hard for us to relate fully what they're thinking, but they probably looked at him with cross-eyed thinking, what did you just say? There's no way that I'm going to take up a cross and follow you. Everybody knew what that fully meant back then. Everybody alive at the, that time, they'd seen firsthand what it entailed. It was torture. It was especially used for the worst of criminals to teach other people a lesson. Don't do this. Don't rise up. Don't steal. Don't murder. All that kind of stuff. It was used to teach a lesson, but it was also used to be very painful, very uh, torturous. Jesus, when he was young, maybe... 10 or 11 years old, I'm not for sure, but um, Judas the Galilean, this guy led a rebellion So a Jesus, in, during Jesus' childhood against Rome. So he's rebelling against Rome because of taxation, I think is what it was. So he raids uh, the, the armory, the, the Rome armory at Sephorus. So Sephorus was a small town just four miles away from Nazareth, all right? Very close. Um, the Rome Vengeance was swift and very sudden, as you would assume. So Sephorus, this town was leveled. It was destroyed because of this. Um, the people that lived there, they, they were sold into slavery. And then about 2,000 of the rebels were crucified. So this is when Jesus was a young boy. 2,000 were crucified, and they were put on those crosses, obviously, and they're lined up along the roadside. That's what they did, just to teach an example to don't do this. So very impressionable moment in, in a young person's life. And so when Jesus says, if you want to come after me, you got to deny yourself and you have to take up your cross. That was a big deal for what that meant. Here's what I think. Taking up your cross meant to, to them, they need to be prepared to face things like that for loyalty to Jesus. Loyalty, remember that word. 
That's what it is today. It's loyalty. It's being faithful to Jesus. When we take up a cross, it means we're loyal to him to the point of sacrifice, all right? We may not, you and I probably are not going to have to give up our lives necessarily for Jesus, but there's going to be sacrifices along the way, isn't there? In order to be loyal to Jesus, there's going to be sacrifices. We're going to have to give up our personal ambition as we surrender to his plan and what he has for us. I challenge you to look at your time that you spend each day. Is it spent in just what you want to do? Or is the time that you're spending uh, something that you say, God, would you have, I give you this day. Would you lead me and guide me by your Holy Spirit? Would you help me to be the, use this day to the fullest? Because I want to honor you with this day. You know, there's sacrifices that are going to be made. It may not be a big um, deal to other people, but to you, it's a very big deal. Ask God to lead you and guide you in that. You may have to sacrifice something that you could fully well afford. But God is saying, no, I need you to be obedient here and sacrifice because there's a greater need that I'm going to ask you to do. It's those little things like that, that that you may have to sacrifice. Think of Jesus. He willingly went to the cross. The Bible says he scorned its shame. Jesus was loyal to his father. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 says this, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. He took the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. This is loyalty. Even to, in, he be, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus was loyal. Think of Jesus. He didn't demand his rights. He took up his cross. He was humble instead of proud to the point of death. And my question is, are you loyal to Jesus? Here's my, here's my concern. Here's my worry. Is that as Christians, we look at that statement, take up your cross, and we can't relate. Right? Because we just don't have crosses, and I understand that. It's hard for me to relate. So we look at that statement, and we think, well, I can't relate. And so here's what happens. We water down our commitment level. All of a sudden, our loyalty is mediocre at best. All because it's, it's hard for us to, to wrap our brains around this and what Jesus is saying. Our loyalty has been reduced to mediocre convenience. Listen, we need a fresh reality check. I'm not calling for us all to like go searching uh, for difficulty in life, all right? That's not what I'm calling for, but we need, to be, we need to realize this is what Jesus said. Take it or leave it, but this is the truth. To be a disciple of him, we have to take up a cross. We have to be willing to, to suffer. We have to be willing to be loyal to him in the face of anything because of what he's asked us to do. You have to be willing. So what part of taking up your cross do you need to do? And finally, Jesus says, follow me. Have you ever played the game, follow the leader? Yeah? I mean, it's, for some of you, Pastor Weaver, it's been a long time, all right? And um, it's been a while since you played those games. But when you play follow the leader, it's... What you What did I say? I don't know what you're talking about. What did I say? <laughs> No, I didn't say that. I just said your name. I'm glad you caught it, though. Good job. For those of you watching online, you can see me later, and I'll tell you what's going on. So. But when you play follow the leader, everything that the leader does, you have to do, right? Uh, as difficult or as ridiculous as it may be, you're playing follow the leader, you follow it. And I don't need to go very much into detail, but when Jesus says, follow me, we follow him. We're obedient to him. The Christian life is a constant following of Jesus. We're, we're obedient in, in our thoughts of what, what the word says. We're obedient to his spirit leading. The Bible says that we need to keep in step with the spirits. And so we need to be obedient with that um, in our actions, all that kind of stuff. This is what it means for anyone willing to be his disciple, no matter what we say yes to Jesus. Deny yourself means no. Follow me 
means yes and saying yes to God, being obedient to him at all costs. We value what God's word says, don't we? We need to value this, just like Pastor August preached this morning. We value God's word. We're loyal to him. And here's the deal. We don't look back. We don't look back and wish our old life was still here. We don't look back and wish that we were still in our selfish, sinful ways, but we keep our eyes focused ahead of us in the calling that Jesus has placed on our life. Luke chapter 9, if you would uh, turn there, starting in verse 57, and Pastor Brett, if you would come join me. About nine days after Jesus has just laid out these steps, like, if you want to be my disciple, here's what it's going to look like. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. This is what Jesus says. About nine or ten days later, Jesus now is talking, and he lays out this example, and he's talking to people. He says, as they were walking in verse 57, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He, he said to another man, Jesus calls him, he says, follow me. But that man replied, Lord, first let me go, bury my father. Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another person said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say, Goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, Nobody who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of the kingdom of God. Three men could have been disciples, but the cost was too high. The first guy, he volunteers. He says, I'll go to you, I'll, I'll follow you. But then when he sees the cost and realizes that Jesus is not living a cush life. He doesn't have a place to lay his head. He doesn't necessarily have just a permanent home to always be at. He, he would have to deny himself. So apparently this guy was a, a used to a comfortable life and he said, no thank you. The second man was called by Jesus. That's a true honor. Jesus says, follow me. But he was rejected because he would not take up the cross and die to himself. He was more worried about someone else's funeral than preparing for his own. Jesus isn't suggesting here that we dishonor our parents, all right? Don't get me wrong about that. Um, here's what he was hoping for, that we don't allow and permit the love that we have for our family to be greater than the love that we have for our Lord Jesus. That's what Jesus is saying. The third man, he also volunteered, but he couldn't follow Christ because he was constantly gonna be looking back. I need to go say goodbye. Goodbyes are okay, but if it gets in the way of obedience, it becomes sin. Jesus knew and Jesus saw that this man's heart would not be fully and wholly with him. He would be constantly looking back. So I wonder if in chapter 10, Jesus very quickly after he chooses disciples and sends them out, he says this, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The Great Commission, guys, is not gonna happen just because we read about it. The Great Commission won't happen just because we hope it does. It's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take commitment. It will take loyalty on our parts to be obedient and follow what Jesus is leading us and guiding us to. But I promise it is a, an abundant life. It's a full life, isn't it? When you step out in faith like that, man, it's like that dad saying to his son, the gym is yours. Like you have this entire space. Jesus has so much to offer for us as we step out. But I promise you, it's going to take work. It's going to take sacrifice. So real quick, I want to give you a couple practical things. I'm not going to lay out details of this because that could very quickly become legalistic. And that's not my heart tonight. But I do want to challenge us in a few ways. First, on the denying side of it, ask the Holy Spirit, what area of your life do you need to deny so that Jesus can be on the throne of your life, all right? What part of your life do you need to deny? Notice Luke, he added the word daily. So he, some of you thought I forgot about that word, I didn't. And Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. I get it, it's easy to sacrifice and to take up your cross and to pay a lot of money and sacrifice a week or two and go on a mission trip right? 
It's easy to go without good food knowing that Chick-fil-A is coming in 10 days, right? It's easy to go without air conditioning, kind of, because you know that when you get home, you'll have a king-size bed and all the air conditioning you can handle. It's easy because we know that's going to happen, but Jesus is saying, I want you to daily do this. I want you to daily be loyal to me. And there may be sacrifices that you make that nobody else knows about. And that's fine because you're not doing it to honor them. You're doing it to honor your Lord Jesus. That's what it is. And so Jesus says daily. So I ask you this. What is something that on a daily basis you know that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you to be loyal to and in? To sacrifice. To take up that cross and, and to be loyal to him obedience following me what does God's word say that you're not obeying what does the Holy Spirit lead you in that you are um, ignoring because it's too difficult you don't want to these are areas that we need to surrender I promise you when we live a life of denying ourselves, of taking up a cross daily and following him that is a life that honors our king And that's what we're called to do, right? To honor our king, to live for him and for his glory. He he was the perfect example, wasn't he? When he went to the cross, he glorified his father. He set that example for us. Now our goal is to live a life that will honor him, that will glorify him. Just like Pastor August preached this morning, we want to live a life that will spur people on to want to know more about Jesus, that will want to crave more of, more of him and, and come into a relationship with him. That's the type of life that we want to live and we need to live. So I want to take a few moments to pray and um, we're just going to go through these three things real quick, and then we'll, we'll end in, in a song. But with your eyes closed, in the time of prayer, the deny side of things, what, what is it that God is speaking to you that you need to deny? Not just for a few days, but what's something that you sense God's Spirit speaking to you? Would you talk to Him about that? Father God, do so. Well, part of the taking up your cross daily and following Jesus is God speaking to you about the loyalty side of it, the daily side of it. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal that to you. Well, part of the following me portion of Jesus saying, is the Holy Spirit speaking to you, the obedience side of it, the, the step of obedience that he's asking you to take and follow him? Is he speaking to you about? Ask him to reveal it to you. Jesus, we thank you for your word that is so powerful, it's so alive that um, it changes people. We thank you for what you're doing and every heart that is here or those that are watching online that you are doing a great work i pray that you would encourage those lord that they won't be discouraged by reading what you said and uh, feel like they don't measure up that they're not a true disciple lord we thank you that you are a loving father you are faithful you're patient you're you're kind you're merciful And I pray that you would help every one of us, God, to take what your word says and apply it to our life. We're not perfect. We thank you that you walk beside us and you help us, you lead us, you disciple us as we are an apprentice as we follow along that you lead us as we go and we're, we're going to figure some of these things out as we we trust you more and more and i pray that you would encourage people tonight to continue to press on to not give up to not quit but lord to see their value in you that they would see their their true value comes from their relationship with you Jesus, you see every need that's represented, 
and you know what's going on. And I pray that you would meet those needs, Jesus. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for being faithful. There's a lot in this book that is not easy to deal with, is there? Um, but I'm so thankful that he not only lays it out for us and, and gives us a guide, but he has an ever presence of the Holy Spirit with us to help us, all right? Just like a child, when they are learning to walk, they're learning to walk. They have never done this before. And as a parent, we help them, right? We, we come alongside and we teach them and we guide them. And I, I know that that's what our, our Heavenly Father does. He helps us. Like these are tough things to grasp and tackle and deal with. And I don't have all the answers to it. You don't have all the answers either, so don't judge me, all right? But the Holy Spirit helps us, all right? And I think that's why um, we are challenged to daily meditate on His Word because there's, there's new perspectives and the Holy Spirit speaks to us um, each day on what's going on in our life and how this applies to our life. This Word is powerful. This Word is very much active for today. We need it. So I'm thankful for the tough things that Jesus has said. Doesn't make it easy, but I'm thankful that we don't have to go about it alone, that we have the Holy Spirit to help us. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you, and then you're, you're free to go, or you're welcome to stay and pray. Father, I pray that you would go with each and every one of us those watching online, that you would go with them as we go into our week, that we would go into this week with purpose, with a filling of your spirit like we've never had before, and that you would give us divine opportunities to share what you've done in our lives. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you are ever present by your Holy Spirit. So Lord, as we read your word, as it becomes our daily bread, that you would help us to understand it and to apply it to our life. In Jesus' powerful name, bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen.